Okay, hello. Um, sharing the whole screen. So we'll just have uh, infinite screens for a moment. Sorry about that. Although I kind of like it, it's pretty, right? Okay, we're live. Um, is there anyone here? I wonder how I find out if there's anyone here. Um, okay, here we go. Hi, Ashley. Yes, yes, exactly. Waving to myself. Infinite screens, and soon we will see infinite log for J's. So yeah, this talk is on the many uh, shapes, are not shapes, but the many hiding places, well, kind of shapes, actually. Shapes is a good uh, a metaphor as well, for, uh, for log for J, the habitats, hiding places, camouflages, log for J. And uh, it's going to be kind of a live coding session. Um, and just to confirm, I believe we have, um, you know, uh, 50 minutes remaining, right? This, does this one go till 3 p.m.? And yeah, okay. That's a good thing to know. Okay. Um, so let's get started with Log4j. I'm going to get myself, bring up a terminal here and get a Log4j. So um, the, the goal here is really to educate everyone about, you know, like jar files, right? I, I have a, a unnatural um, passion for jar files. When I was a, a teaching assistant at UBC, I was working on a PhD. Sadly, had to uh, drop out of that PhD. You know, life happened. Life got a lot more complicated than a PhD. So I had to drop out. This was back in uh, 2013. But I was so, I was, my, my passion for jar files is over 10 years old. And um, let's get a session. Let's get a terminal. Terminal, you guys are in there. I'm not, I'm a Linux person. I've only, I'm only deigned to go on a terminal here for this talk here because, uh, you know, web conference software doesn't usually work on Linux, or right? you usually can't share screen on Linux. So I'm, I'm in a foreign land here with uh, being on on a, on a Mac. So everything will be painful for me. Forgive me. Are you guys the same size? You guys are the same size. Let's have three of you. Um, okay. And let's go jump to the other machine. And what is that machine? You are, oh, what? My other machine has a naughty IP address today. Oh no, oh well. That was not on purpose. This is where all my good log for day samples are, is on that machine. So anyway, yeah, so I, like I was saying, Back in my UBC uh, days when I was starting that PhD, um, yeah, one of the my students actually at the end of the semester, he gave me a jar file, not a file, a jar, an actual jar, just a glass jar. At the end of the semester, he says, you are so passionate about jar files, I just, I had to get you this. And so I still have this jar in my, in my cupboard. Um, so jar files, for those that aren't familiar, are, it's how you, um, store, uh, how you put together, how you distribute um, Java code, right? Just like, you know, DLLs are often how you distribute uh, C++ or, or C Sharp uh, that's being developed on Windows. Well, jar files are how you distribute um, Java code. And I'm actually passionate about all um, distribution formats for software. I'm passionate about gem files, that's Ruby. I'm passionate about, um, you know, NPM files, of course. That's uh, the JavaScript. Uh, DLLs, um, Go modules, all of them. But Java was my first language. And so I have a special love for jar files. And, and, and Log4j, of course, comes down as a jar file. So don't, uh, yeah, don't tell the other languages um, that I feel that way about Java, please. I don't want them to feel bad. Anyway, moving on here to log4j. 
the problem with log4j or the problem with any really any distributable piece of code any you know compiled artifact i know technically java is not compiled but i mean what i mean is like any this thing you know box container oh can't use that word anymore any um just packaging you know module component library all of these things a way that we compartmentalize software such that we can refer it to as a thing, like, oh, the log for JHR, any of those, right? Um, they kind of like, when a known vulnerability drops, like the huge uh, log for JCVE, CVE 2021, uh, what was it? 44228, right? Um, that CVE says, oh, if you have Log4j, if you have this version of Log4j, you need to not have that version of Log4j. You need to have a different version of Log4j. Otherwise, you're going to get, you know, exploited severely. It was an amazing, amazing CVE. One of my favorite CVEs in the last five years. In the last five years, I have two favorite CVEs. And this one definitely was one of them. So, but this, this problem is right is like oh, if you have log4j this version of log4j you need to not have that version you need to not be running that because in that version of log4j is the bad code the bad code that can be compelled tricked into you know giving away the keys to the kingdom so um there suddenly there becomes like this almost epistemological problem when I say log4j 2.16.0, what do I mean, right? So let's start there. Um, I think I'm in a directory here called log4j. So if I say log4j, oh, you silly Mac. Sorry, I'm going to be grumpy about being on a Mac this whole time because I have no idea how to use them. It's StreamYard. Oh, infinite windows again. Um, just seeing any, any, oh, we've got private chats. Oh, I can't share the private chats. That's bad. I did though. Yes. Um, yeah, there's a log for J deep down there somewhere. So initially when we say log for J uh, 2.16, I think it's dot o right do we mean this guy this by the way this is uh repo one dot maven dot org and when developers build java projects like with their you know if you're if you've got all the java tool chain and all the uh, compilers and intellij and eclipse and all that good stuff like if you're making a java application um, by default, this is where you're going to get your libraries from, repo1.maven.org. Uh, it's actually uh, hosted and maintained by Sonatype. And so Sonatype, they compete with my company, uh, MergeBase. And so I'm always uh, very bitter that they get to host this because they get to call companies up and they'll be like, huh, do you know, um, hi there, VMware. We just want to let you know, you guys downloaded this bad version of Log4j uh, 82,000 times in the last week. Just thought maybe you might want to give us a call. So, you know, because we don't host uh, repo one dot maven.org. We don't have data like that. We can't call up a company and say, I mean, I guess we could, but we'd just be making things up. We wouldn't have empirical data like Sonatype does. Yeah, this is actually hosted by Sonatype. Sonatype's an interesting company, right? Because um, it was the whole Maven team, the team that in, invented and made Maven, which is a critical tool in the Java world for building software uh, at Apache. They uh, they formed a startup, and, and Sonatype was their startup. They, they launched that startup like probably 17 years ago. Anyway, so when I say log4j 2.16.0, do I mean this one? Right in here, let's bring it down. Okay. And voila, so now I have log4j. And in this log4j is the bad code, right? That causes the, 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 the terrible vulnerability. Um, for those, I mean, I'm, I figure probably everyone here today uh, is familiar with that vulnerability. But just in case you aren't, 
uh, just in case there's the one, I'm, I mean, because I'm sure I have like a thousand people in the audience today, right? Very popular talk. And so there's probably like one out of those thousand people that hasn't heard of the log for j vulnerability. And um, so the deal with the log4j vulnerability is log4j is, is a logging framework. And uh, it goes back to actually 1999. I was looking at the source code of it. Um, it was a proprietary private piece of code developed in 1998, 1999. Um, and then it was donated to the Apache Software Foundation in, I think, around 2002. And yeah, it was like, it was a revelation. It's a beautiful, beautiful logging framework, beautiful piece of software. Like for those that had been trying to do application logs in 2001 with Java, including me, um, you know, you just would do horrible hacky things. And then Log4j came and it just showed you this beautiful way to just uh, leverage this natural structure of, of Java programs to, to, um, to do your application logging and just in a beautiful natural way. And so since Log4j like actually goes back all the way to 2002, it's it's in everything. It, and and um, it was such a beautiful library with such a beautiful mechanism for doing logging um, that, you know, it, it really is pervasive. It, it, you know, it, like you write a good library, like a library this good. I can only dream to write a library this good. Um, it's going to be everywhere. So with it being everywhere um now here comes this problem is that they had this cute little feature that they um uh that they brought into the product around 2012 i believe um i could be wrong about that but it, sometime in the last 10 years they brought in this cute um feature to help make logging even more convenient for you know application developers of this uh substitution uh, this uh, this key value lookup mechanism but the problem with this this um, this lookup mechanism was that um, any log message that came into log4j to be sent to disk um, to be logged you know to a log file on disk um, would could take advantage of this substitution method any log message could like they just accidentally um, didn't realize that. I think the moment the developer saw that this was uh, possible, that any substitution um, anywhere, it was originally the substitution logic was actually for the config files, but then because it was so convenient, it got uh, ported over to the main logging uh, infrastructure. But then because it was, um, I think the developers just, just didn't quite realize, oh, this, this lookup, this neat lookup substitution routine is, available um, to anyone writing a log. So if anyone can control the log message, any aspect of the log message, uh, they could trigger this lookup routine. And then the lookup routines, there was like a whole bunch of them. You could do JNDI lookups, LDAP lookups. You could even like go to some code repository and download bytecode, Java bytecode on the fly if you coded um, the substitution lookups carefully, right, based on the uh, JNDI. And so essentially anyone that could have any control over the logging message could cause, you know, remote code execution. And so you had this funny situation on Minecraft servers where log4j was logging all messages in the client. Minecraft actually, uh, po very popular versions of Minecraft are, were written in Java, continue to be written in Java on the server and in the client. I think the PC version, I think on the iPhone, it's not in Java, but I think in the, on the PC version, uh, it is in Java, and of course, it needs application logging, and it was logging all chats. So if a player was chatting with other players, Log4j would be the, the software that was actually handling that. Oh, someone, well, not handling the chat, but logging all the chats. And so um, this situation was happening where one player could use the exploit to take over every other player's computer and the server's computer. Right, uh, this RC was so hilarious um, in that regard because they control the chat message that they're sending, and since the chat message gets logged to disk and they have full control over what they chat to the other players, they could just type in the exploit. So that was amusing. So this was a severe, severe bug, and so now you get to this problem of, you know, is log4j um, 216 
dotto in my system. So um, normally I would ask the audience, so how would you do it? How would you find out if log4j 2.16, the vulnerability itself actually goes back to like pretty much the whole 2.x uh, branch up to 2.16. Log4j 1.x, uh, very uh, different uh, implementation. 2.0 was a complete rewrite. And so this vulnerability, because 2.0, the 2.x is a complete rewrite, the vulnerability is only in the 2.x series. Uh, if you were on long4j1.x, you got other vulnerabilities to worry about, but nothing quite as bad as this one. So anyway, yeah, let's, do we have log4j2.16.0 or earlier? How would you, how would you find that out on your system? I'm gonna, let's infinite mirror each other to see if anyone has any ideas. Um, so far, no idea. So if you have an idea, how would you find log4j 2.16 on, on your system? Give you guys 10 more seconds if anyone has an idea. Okay. Well, um, one popular idea was to, you know, just take the, the of log for day itself, right? Like, so you could just take a SHA-1 or a MD5, like, you know, people can say that MD5 is insecure, but for this kind of situation where you're just trying to identify is a file on your disk, it's, it's totally reasonable. Um, so if you see this hash anywhere on your file system, including, um, you know, uh, a zip inside a zip inside a zip, right? You can just, you know, recursively descend into the zip files and just scan every file inside of them. If you see this, then yeah, definitely uh, that's a bad situation. The uh, the problem though, is that uh, the jar files are actually zip files and zip files are actually fairly um, resilient against um, um, you know, uh, just like byte changes to them. And um, like, for example, I can just like append a space to the, to the zip file and it's still a completely valid zip file. It's still gonna work um, completely fine. It's got no problems. Uh, see, I can get a listing of it. I can unzip it, um, right? So it's totally fine. It's not complaining of, uh, you know, any problems at all, but I added a space to it. So it's it's going to have a completely different SHA-1 sum. So, I mean, that's not really uh, a way that you, um, that the jar files are getting changed. People aren't normally adding spaces to them. But um, my point, right, is just like, like, um, we're not so much worried that the jar files on this, what we're worried about, yeah, sorry. Um, you, you go away, you're making it hard for me to see. Are we still sharing though? Do, 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 do. Oh yeah, oh, so I just go there, hide, and then you come back. Okay, cool. Yeah, my like my point, right, is that um, the um, what we're concerned about, right, is that the logic, right? It's the logic that causes the um, causes the bug, right? It's not the uh, the file itself that causes the bug. And um, sure enough, right? Like, uh, let's go, let's go um, build some class files. Like let's let's um, and, and other factors, right? Like um, for example, zip files themselves have date stamps, right? So if I were to build log4j core, um, and so I have a little example that I'll use. Let's go get the log4j detector that we, that I built. OK, 
Okay. Go in here, and we're gonna go. It's, and so, what I'm just gonna show you. It, um, so for example, we'll start with by just building it. So I'm gonna build it right now. Um, and my point here is about jar files. So now I've got log4j detector latest. And so let's put that here, log4j detector latest. Uh, we'll call it old because I, I built it. And let's rebuild it, build it again. And then let's call this one new, right? So it's the exact same code, old and new, and it's, um, you know, exact same byte count, etc. But is it going to have the same SHA-1 sum? Pretend it was. This is the actual log4j library itself. I just want to show you something about using SHA-1s or you know any byte-oriented signature to detect log4j. Just have to remember how to control paste here. Do something exciting there. So if I, uh, there's the one we just did, and there's the one I did a seconds ago, right? Why do they have such different um, SHA-1? So this is not gonna work, right? Detecting based on SHA-1 is not gonna work because I just built the exact same code uh, minutes apart and they're having different SHA-1s. I'm, I'm sure half the people, if not more on, on, this, on the call here, uh, know the answer, but I will tell you anyway. And the reason, see if you can spot the difference. That's the new one. And so I'm just doing a listing on it, right? So you are old. And you are new, 88203, 27, 27, 26, 27, well, 1375, 1375. Looks like I don't even know why they're different. Um, did perhaps the Palm Bot properties? Because I did a maven clean, maven install. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's new. That's old. So, I mean, the timestamps. I'm curious, like, the timestamps don't look. Oh, yeah, yeah, because that's 227. It's the seconds that changed um, on them. And I'm just not seeing the seconds in this listing. That's right. So I should have uh, waited like a minute before doing builds, and then we would have seen the minute changed. I guess we could do that now because it's probably been a minute. So I built it again, and you are you can be new. Yeah, so you can see it's using four two thirty as the timestamp now. Whereas before it was using 227 as the timestamp. Well, those timestamps are part of the byte stream. And so because the timestamp, the build time of the jar file itself is, is, is changing based on the time that we build it, then that's going to cause the, the SHA-1 to change, right? So that's why, that's one of the reasons why a finger-based um, approach is, is not going to work, right? Like, it's true. The nice thing about the fingerprint based approach is, you know, probably 95% of log4j 2.16.0s in the world are going to just come from Maven Central. People don't rebuild log4j normally. Normally they just download it from here and copy it into their system and off it goes. I guess, but my point is that, you know, this bug is so severe that the fact that 95% of the time the jar file will actually be byte for byte identical is this one. 
here on Maven Central uh, is not good enough, right? Like that 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 five percent chance, and that's just my gut saying that um, that you might not have the byte for byte identical version here. Like maybe you're running Artifactory in house, and maybe your Artifactory resigns the jar files. Um, that's I've seen that pattern where people set up signing keys on their internal Artifactory. Um, and so Artifactory is going to be resigning all the jar files before it lets your internal systems bring them into its uh, into its build, right? Well, that's going to, again, that's going to perturb the key. So, right? So if you do a, a scan looking for this SHA-1 fingerprint, again, you're, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss all the log footage. Or if you guys, if you have a policy, like, you know, Gentoo is a famous Linux distribution of having a policy of, of rebuilding the operating system from scratch, right? Well, not from scratch, but every new package that you bring down is going to get recompiled before it's installed in your Gentoo, right? So if you take a, if you were to run a similar philosophy with your own Java application, that means you're going to download and re recompile Log4j every time you do a build, right? Like, that's not an unreasonable, uh, um, you know, best. I wouldn't call it a best practice, but it's a, it's not an unreasonable practice uh, when building software to be like, okay, all my dependencies they better build, and I better build them myself, right? Well, again, this uh, a fingerprint based approach is not going to work. So what do we got to do if a fingerprint of the jar file is not good enough? Let's see if uh, any comments here. Okay, Tim, good to see you, Tim. Um, run Black Duck. Yeah, definitely. I'm curious to just know how Black Duck will do, um, if it can find it in all its variations. Um, you could unzip the WAR files. Okay, so let's unzip. <laughs> you could just look for every jar file that has the word log in it, too. Well, wow. okay, more problems there. Um, let us evaluate all of those ideas. And by the way, thank you for the um, the comments. I'm I'm really appreciate the comments. That makes this more fun for me. Um, so the first one is run Black Duck. I don't have a Black Duck license, so I can't do that. Probably that would work well. I am very curious to know. I actually have a whole corpus of um, log4j samples. I think I called it log4j samples. So um, if anyone has, yeah, if anyone has a Black Duck license, um, if they would like to take this corpus, so it has all these different versions of Log4j done as Uber jars, done as uh, shaded jars, uh, done as uh, Spring Boot executable jars, right, et cetera, done as exploded jars. So if you have a Black Duck license, I would be very curious, like if you were to take my Log4j samples repository, and um, and clone it, and then um, and then run Black Duck against it. I would be very grateful. That is. I'm sorry. I just don't know how to use Mac. Plus, okay, you. I'm just going to use the mouse. Yeah, we can do the mouse. The mouse can do this. Yes. And this is a public repository. Anyone's free to clone it. Um, and down come all these nice variations of log4j. And so use the log4j samples repository to test your scanners. See what your scanners think. And we've got the false hits. Whoops. Uh, you got the false hits. So these ones. Um, Yeah, do not have the bad vulnerability. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. 2.16 actually was patched later. It's the 2.14 that has it. Um, there were some follow-up vulnerability, so they quickly, the team quickly brought out 2.17.1. So these are all the versions of Log4j that don't have the vulnerability, including uh, API and SLF4j and old Log4j 1.x and exploded, right? And then the true hits. So just take your, um, so these are all versions of Log4j that have the vulnerability in various uh, incarnations. These are just downloaded from Maven Central. But then I explode them, I shade them, I do Spring Boot executable of them, I Uber jar them. These are different ways that people 
package up Java and distribute it. And then uh, and then finally, oh yeah, old hits log for j1.x, right? See what your scanner thinks of that. So yeah, regarding Black Duck, I would love to know if anyone's got a Black Duck license, please run it against this uh, public um, repository, log for j samples on GitHub. And uh, and let me know. I'd be very grateful. Um, now, as for unzipping the WAR files, if we just unzip every WAR file, then the jar files will be in there, right? Um, and or unzip the jar files themselves, right? Because if it's just a date stamp problem, um, for example, this one that I was building. If it's just a if it's just a date stamp problem, what you could do is um, forget about the date stamps, right? So this is a cool idea, and I'm actually going to go somewhere else to do this idea. Here, right? Because, and I'm going to take a copy of that. Okay. You can be Java 8, and you can be Java 11, and you can be Java, I think I got Java 17, and you can be Java 6, sure. Let's start with Java 6. So what I'm going to do, one six. hopefully it works. I don't know if Java 6 even works on this computer anymore. And that's done. We built the class files, right? Uh, so my example, what I'm trying to show here is that even uh, compiler variation, unfortunately, um, will perturb the signatures. So that's Java 6. Let's do Java 8. Um, Oh, which Java 8 should I go with? Uh, I mean, the thing, you won't, usually you won't see, um, oh, yeah. Sorry, I don't have a file called A. Okay. So which one should we just use for maybe util.class looks kind of interesting. So I'm going to do a SHA-1 sum on util.class. And then let's do the same in our, log, in our Java 6. And lo and behold, right, exact same source code, but I used Java 6 as a compiler versus Java 8 in the compiler, and oh no, the um, the bytes have changed. So unfortunately, that means um, taking signatures of the underlying, um, like taking byte signatures, like SHA-1 signatures of the fingerprints of the uh, underlying class files is not going to work either because uh, Compiler variation is going to trip it up. I'll even go, I mean, of course, um, compiler variation, like um, um, like back in the Java 8 here. Um, of course, if I go like, you know, like that, you know, optimization level, of course, that's going to um, um, have change it as well. How do you do that? How do I do optimization level? Da, 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 da. And debug symbols, of course. So if I do, yeah, debugging info, that's like, you know, there's all these different ways that you can um, perturb the byte code uh, as you're compiling. I can't remember how to set the optimization level on in the compiling. Um, but even just the version, yeah, as I've showed, Java six, Java eight, I could keep doing it. I, you know, I could go do Java um, seventeen, Java eleven. But I think you guys believe me that every one of those is going to have different signatures. So unfortunately, um, unzipping them all and looking at the underlying fingerprints of the actual class files, which contain the logic of the vulnerability, that's not going to work either. It's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna be bulletproof. And the, the goal here is we want something bulletproof. Like this is a severe vulnerability. Um, 
and we don't want to have any any chance that uh, that that vulnerable version is is on disk. And then yeah, looking for looking for all files with log in the name. It's a it's a very good fast approach. Um, but again, I mean, you can even see with the samples here. With the true hits, um, it's it's not. These are all true hits, eh? So this like um, this jar war zip year and this zip file and this final jar, right? Like they all uh, have the vulnerable version of log4j in them. And so, for example, in the Uber, unfortunately, looking for. Log, yeah, it's not going to find it in that case. Uber drivers are very interesting. I've actually I've written a, a blog post about them. Um, encourage you guys to go look at that. Uh, Uber jars. Um, what would you? Um, I guess you just put merge based my company or Julius. If you just go Uber jars Julius, and then I think you get it. Yeah, software composition analysis versus Uber jars, right? So they're a funny way that Java gets distributed that is actually not that uncommon. For example, um, has, does anyone here uh, use Jira or Bitbucket or Confluence? And if you use those products, Bitbucket or Jira or Confluence, on-prem, the on-prem versions of those products, um, you've probably used the plugins, right? Where you go to the plugins to say, oh, I'll take this, you know, I can draw charts in my Jira tickets if I take this plugin. Or this other plugin, it helps me do timesheets in my Jira. And this plugin helps me, like, uh, draw sequence diagrams in, in directly on the glass in Confluence, right? Well, those plugins, they tend to be built using this Uber um, approach. That's just how Atlassian Java plugins, all Atlassian plugins for Confluence, Jira, and Bitbucket are Java, because Atlassian, those are Java project products. And the plugins themselves are put together using this Uber technique, right? And so you might have an Atlassian Jira plugin using Log4j. And so you're going to need a technique um, that and can you know deal with this this situation if you want to make sure that you know all your disks in your corporation don't have log for day. Um, so good little uh, blog article on this in this problem. Mm. So I mean, so far I've I've shown you all that that the fingerprint based approaches just aren't going to work here. Um, what will work, however, is to look, and this is what I ended up doing when I, I made a log4j detector. Um, let's just run it, it's fun, fun to run. Um, a detector. So when I made this log4j detector, um, let's use the latest. Um, it, the goal was to look at everything on disk uh, to any recursion level, right? N no matter how things were put together, um, including shaded. Shaded is wild because that's where the log4j code is actually renamed. Um, all the class names are renamed to different class names uh, to avoid class path conflicts. And so I'm looking at it. What the goal is, I, I realize, like. What we need to look at is the source code, is the binary code itself. We're going to have to look at the raw uh, binary code there to look for specific patterns uh, in the binary code that help identify the version of log4j using as little log4j code as possible, too, right? Because, um, you know, maybe what if someone only grabs 30% uh, of log4j in their system but happens to grab the vulnerable part? Like, I mean, that's sort of an, that would be insane. If someone was like, you know what, I just want 30% of log4j in my system. But, you know, it's, uh, I guess it's conceivable. And and that that saying that I live by is if you can imagine it, it exists. It does exist on the internet somewhere, if you can imagine it. So I wanted a, a detector that would be robust against um, 
all these possible ways of taking Locker Jay and, and distributing them. And so let me show you what I came up with in the end. And we can just go to the Log4j detector itself. Log4j detector. And see the horrible logic. Make this a little bigger. Uh, we're going to go into the source directory. And here it is, Log4j detector. These are just utility classes just to help with, you know, the JSON, you know, because people um, asked for a, a, a JSON output, for example, right? Oh, here, have a JSON output then. And this, you know, parsing and, and dealing with the strings and the output. Um, but so here's where it's actually happening. Open source uh, log4j detector, you know, uh, public repository. You don't need to talk to you don't need to talk to us. We are, you know, a vulnerability scanning company. We 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 make a vulnerability scanner, but uh, you, to use this tool, you don't need to talk to us. It's on it's on GitHub. It's public. So what we ended up doing is. Um, when you look at log4j itself, um, right? So if we look at the um, the library inside it, you see this this sort of um, this structure, right? There's these subdirectories, right? So the core, async, core, filter, core, pattern. So we look for um, this this pat this structure. And it turns out, right, like if you have a file called core and log event and core.appender and core.filter, if you have like these, um, you know, these five files, then you probably have log4j2.x on your system. And if you have this, then you probably have log4j1.x on your system. And if you have this file, well, this file only showed up after log4j2.10, right? So you can imagine I just spent you know, probably, probably a couple dozen hours just crawling through Log4j because Log4j itself, of course, is a public, open uh, Apache published piece of software. So I just looked at all the versions of Log4j and just tried to figure out when did this file show up, and then, you know, once I actually figured out, um, so when did this, when did these files show up, and then, um, and then I realized. In addition, um, Java, because of the way Java works, um, these string literals are part of error messages or part of uh, property lookups. Well, string literals are actually stored as is directly in the bytecode, right? So if you have an error message, if log4j is going to say something like invalid J and DI URL, you know, it's going to complain um, with some error message. It, um, it turns out that error message will be stored directly in, in the class file. So you can look for that error message. And since I realized that that error message only showed up starting in log4j 2.15, you know, I can use that to be like, okay, well, because I see that error message, I know that we're at least 2.15 or newer, right? And because I see this config option as a string literal, like this sequence of bytes occurs in the class file, then I know we're on 2.16 or like. So yeah, it was just a combination of looking for files and directories, and then within those files and directories, looking for byte patterns um, that were present. And what's nice about these file names and these byte patterns is um, they are stable. Like there's nothing you can do uh, to perturb them uh, through compiler variation or through your environment. No, like these are core aspects of log4j that no matter how you build it, build it on Windows or package it up in some weird way or only download, you know, a half of log4j to just the bare minimum to get you doing what you want. You know, these are the things that are going to be in there. Now, you know, when I'm saying like this, only download 50% of that, that's just me being crazy. That would, I don't think it would do that. Yeah, so that's how I did it in the end. Is just looking in in the um, looking them through the source code and, and looking for the things that were stable that I could almost use as as flag posts as markers to to really um, be certain that these versions of log4j were present. And then you know, on top of that, you have the whole. Um, um, you know, the whole like uh, jar inside jar inside jar, et cetera. My scanner does not do TARS, right? My, my The reason I don't do TARS is just I've never in my experience as a Java, well, there's two reasons. One is um, 
TARS, I, I didn't, there's no uh, tooling that I'm aware of uh, that can uh, stream them, like can, that can recursively handle TARS inside TARS in a streaming fashion. You'd have to, you have to dump them out to temp files. And I just didn't want to deal with temp files in this library. You know, it already was doing enough. Um, yeah, outputting to temp files, preserving the structure, and then cleaning up after you're done. I was just, that was too much for me for this quick little uh, utility. Whereas with jar files, you can actually, and zip files, uh, because of the way they're structured, there is good utilities, including in the JVM, for, um, for just um, peer in-memory operation of them, right? And so I never had to deal with temp files. But on top of that, and probably the same reason, is um, I just never ran into a situation where a tar file containing Java code um, was being executed on a system, right? Because because uh, Java just the execution it's always war files or zip files or jar files. So probably if you have a tar, especially a tar.gzip, it's uh, it's you, you it's not great that it's on your file system, but probably it's it's very unlikely that it's being executed in any way. Yeah. So um, yeah. So that is my talk on 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 log4j and and how you would find it. I think the main takeaway really um, is like if you if you got scanners, um, like if you've got a vulnerability scanner like uh, dependency check or black duck or merge base, um, I really encourage people to put together uh, synthetic samples. Um, ahead of time where you know it's vulnerable and you know that you've seen code deployed in this way and just to make sure that the scanner finds it like i've been doing that a lot lately i've been uh putting together docker images where i would take like a log for jar file and just copy it into the docker image just be like here just be here in a random directory in this docker image here log for jar and then i would say okay snick tell me what you think or or um quay uh, .io. Well, tell me what you think. Or Red Hat, tell me what you think. And none of them find it, right? They always are like, they're always saying like, yes, we find all the vulnerabilities. But it's like, if you just huck vulnerable war files, vulnerable jar files, vulnerable DLLs directly into these Docker containers, they don't seem to find it. So I I, I really encourage yeah, everyone when you're evaluating scanners, or if you currently have scanners, vulnerability scanners, and you're not evaluating them, maybe reevaluate them, right? Like literally once a year, once every six months, just be like, you know what, let's throw some weird files at it and see what it thinks. Or let's throw our own files at it. The way we package software, the way we deploy software, let's do a, do a little package of your own software, precede it with, um, with vulnerabilities, but do it all the way that you package it and then see what the scanners think. Um, okay, we have Tim saying a specific file, specific configuration parameter, um, recursive unzip find grepish would identify its present. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, one thing that's neat about Java. Now, this is, um, this is a quirk of Java in that um, when Java's tooling creates a jar file, Java's tooling will be like, oh, you're putting a jar file inside a jar file. Well, I'm going to skip compression in that case. Because you're doing a jar file inside a jar file, I'm not going to compress the jar, this inner jar file. Um, right? And so because of that, that meant the table of contents on the inner jar file is not uh, perturbed. <laughs> Word of the day, perturbed. Um, and so that meant you could do... Um, a recursive grep. So if you did a recursive grep for, um, bah, 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 let's see, for like if you did a recursive grep for J and DI lookup, right? Uh, dot class, just this. This became a very powerful grep because you could just do a recursive grep for that. But it does, it is assuming that that means the jar file was created using Maven or using uh, the jar command, not the zip command. Because the zip command doesn't feel the same way. The zip command is like, oh, jar file inside a jar file. Let's compress that whole darn thing. Let's try our best. Zips, like even though they know they even though we know recompressing a zip a second time is useless, the, the zip command doesn't know that, but the jar command does. Uh, and then Zanita, how long did it take me to build the scanner, the log for your scanner? Um, it took about 10 hours to get the uh, initial version of the door. 
um, because of course I, um, I just, based on, you know, my deep, um, passion for jar files and Java and also some, um, research ideas that I'd been, um, been chatting with, with my supervisor, uh, my old master supervisor, we've stayed in contact and he tells me his ideas now and again, like probably a few times a year we get together. And he had mentioned that identifiers, uh, class names, and even inner variables tend to be globally unique. Like there's this, this crazy, um, thing that happens in the software world where, you know, this, um, I mean, I mean, of course, in the Java world, we're making them um, globally unique on purpose. But like, for example, NoSQL Appender probably is globally unique. That's probably a, a globally unique name uh, in that no other library in the world, no other software system in the world will have that name. I mean, of course, once you add log4j slash core slash appender, that's globally unique on purpose. But it turns out even this probably is globally unique. So I was, and so he, my supervisor for my master's, that's, I mean, that's what he specializes in. And so he's done some research on that. And so he kind of gave me that idea that, you know, you don't need that much of the name, just a little bit like core slash layout, boom, that's going to be globally unique. So that's the fact that that pattern has, it was on the file is going to, is going to be all that you need. It's a weird, um, uh, unintuitive uh, result in the software engineering world. Yeah, so 10 hours to get the first version out and then and then dropped another 30 hours into it over the rest of December. Because I got the first version out uh, on the Sunday, right after Log4j dropped. Log4j dropped late on a Thursday night, and I had the detector out by Sunday. And then as GitHub issues and bug tickets came in, I further improved it, probably put in another 30, so 40 hours in total. Yeah, uh, Zanita, my pleasure. Yeah, and um, I guess I will stop sharing screen. And yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for coming. And uh, yeah, be careful with all your files out there. Um, there could be bad things in them. And uh, be careful with your scanners because you gotta you gotta exercise them. It's like flossing once a year. Make your scanners find the vulnerabilities that you proceed with them. Precede vulnerabilities into your files to make sure your scanners are still finding the vulnerabilities like they should. Bye-bye, everyone. Sayonara.